The year was filled with lots of breakthroughs in space exploration. However, we have selected the most important updates about Mars, our potential second home. The Red Planet has been the focus of attention, investment, and collaborations by major spacefaring bodies around the world who want to know as much as possible before landing humans on the surface of the planet. Space enthusiasts had to start the year with the news that NASA was retiring the InSight Mars lander mission after four years of faithful service. InSight was put in place to study the deep interior of the planet, which is basically the processes that led to its formation. The French space agency, Centre National d'Etudes Spatiales, CNES, and ETH Zurich's Mars Quake Service were tasked with its daily supervision. One piece of information that would excite you is that we are now able to study the planet's crust, mantle, and core, enabling us to determine the age of the red planet's surface. And one of the interesting discoveries during these studies was that Mars had Mars quakes. Yes, Mars quakes, just like earthquakes and moonquakes, but this time on Mars. Technically, the event of Mars quakes had happened a few months earlier, but this was something that needed more supervisory work done. On Earth, an earthquake would involve a breaking up of the Earth's crust into large pieces that move around. That doesn't happen on Mars because the crust of the red planet is similar to a shell. It's just one solid plate. How do Mars quakes occur then? When the planet cools down, its crust starts to shrink, and this causes breaks, which are known as faults. Mars quakes are simply that activity of breaking. The Mars quakes themselves produce what we now know as seismic waves, which is what figure out when and where the quakes occurred and how powerful they were. Using its highly sensitive seismometer, about 1,319 Mars quakes have been recorded. Some of these quakes on Mars have been attributed to meteoroid impacts and payloads on InSight, like SEIS, with a highly sensitive seismometer record seismic waves produced by these impacts. With the number of quakes that have been detected, it's clear this planet is more active than Earth. Most of these recorded quakes would be negligible had they taken place on Earth. However, in May of 2022, InSight captured the largest Mars quake with an estimated magnitude of 5. So where were these strong Mars quakes found? A region known as Cerberus Fossae. Here, another amazing discovery was made. Cerberus Fossae was a volcanic area that may have had lava flows occurring in the past few million years. This means that volcanic activity, even without lava flowing on the surface, can be another way Mars quakes occur. For evidence, scientists looked at falling boulders, which were originally positioned on top of cliffs. Using orbiting spacecraft to see these falling boulders, scientists can put forward the argument that perhaps the rocks were shaken down by large Mars quakes. Because really, what else would move them? Moving on, thanks to the Emirate Mars mission, which deployed the Hope probe into Mars's wide orbit so it could characterize the planet's weather and climate systems to provide a complete picture of Mars's atmospheric layers. We have a full picture of Mars, captured by the HOPE's EXI instrument from an altitude of 15,350 miles. A team of scientists worked on the global map by combining over 3,000 observations from the EXI. The work took two years to complete. The Mars map shows the planet's many features with high resolution, such as the polar ice caps, mountains, volcanoes, ancient riverbeds, valleys, and impact craters. These are important to help future scientific research. For example, now we are able to observe Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system, Ascrius Mons, Pavonis Mons, and Arzia Mons, three shield volcanoes, not to forget the mighty canyon system, Valles Marineris. So when another report from InSight about a different volcanic region called Tharsis showed a lack of activity, we had an idea of the location because Hope had provided an atlas of Mars. The problem now was there were no Mars quakes at what is the region of Mars's three largest volcanoes, located some significant distance from InSight. Instead of concluding that Cerberus Fossae is one of its kind, and volcanic activity might not be responsible for Mars quakes, researchers believe that these quakes happen at Tharsis too. It is just that the size of Mars's liquid core creates an area where seismic waves can't pass, an area named the Shadow Zone. Much more than that, the High Resolution Imaging Science Experiment, High Rise Camera, and InSight have also revealed that the collision of these meteoroids created impact craters and boulder-sized blocks of water ice around them. These impact craters were referred to as beautiful by a Mars impact specialist. 
The meteoroid's explosion created three major pieces that created craters on impact. Here are the images captured by NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which passed over the impact sites to note their locations. Scientists believe they would be able to find more impacts in past studies in future ones, which is an important idea given this is the only way a record of past geologic events like meteorite impacts can be noted and remembered. They will have to update their models to get a more accurate estimate of the number of impacts that happened in the early solar system by measuring the impact craters that are visible on Mars today. Then it becomes possible to now estimate correctly the age of the planet's surface, thanks to these meteorite impacts which are proving to be an invaluable piece of the puzzle to understanding the planet's surface. While looking at what the high-rise camera captured of Mars's surface, you can see there were certain similarities with Earth's. You could easily forget you were looking at another planet. One of those similarities was obvious when taking a closer look at the surface. Thanks to SEIS, two new things were revealed about the planet's surface. One is that Mars's crust is thinner than previously assumed. And two, the crust is made up of three sublayers, which are very similar to Earth's crust. A closer look at the crust was made possible because seismic waves from any impact or a Mars quake from any other source traveled through the planet's core and reflected off of subterranean layers and this provided scientists a glimpse of invisible elements below the surface. By measuring the changes in the movement of the waves due to the result of these reflections, they were able to provide the information that the topmost layer of Mars's crust has a depth of 6 miles, while the layers beneath, which stretched another 25 miles, were denser and contained more iron-rich material, giving us the first insight into the underground structure of Mars. Reports from Jet Propulsion Laboratory Describe Mars's lithosphere as a rigid layer made up of the crust and upper mantle. It adds that the Martian lithosphere extends about 310 miles below the surface before it transitions into the remaining mantle layer, which is relatively cool compared with Earth's mantle. Mars's mantle extends to 969 miles below the surface, where it meets the planet's core. Another thing JPL mentioned was the size of Mars's core, which it said was larger than expected. The radius of the core, after measuring, was 1,137 miles. The core's density was also denser than what was projected. We now know that Mars has a liquid iron alloy core at its center, just like Earth's liquid outer core and solid inner core, although it must be noted that the state of Mars's inner core is still unknown. With the data from SEIS, they were able to build the first seismically constrained models for the elastic property of Mars's core. The models help scientists to understand that Mars's core is rich in sulfur, while other elements like oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon are available in smaller portions. The value of this knowledge is seen when models of planetary accretion, evolution, and composition need to be constructed. InSight's Heat Flow and Physical Properties Package, or HP3, was designed to find its way 16 feet into the crust, measure the temperature at various depths, and keep an eye on how heat is released toward the surface. With the seismic data available, researchers can now reconstruct Mars's heat history by combining those data with additional geophysical metrics. Based on what has been discovered, it appears that the mantle of Mars is relatively hot and that the temperature of the uppermost mantle was formerly lower than it is now. Since we are deep inside the internal corridors of Mars, InSight also provided some answers as to why there was no more magnetosphere on the planet. Knowing the importance of Earth's magnetosphere to the prevention of catastrophic radiation on its surface, what caused the loss of Mars's protective shield needed to be investigated. Having had a magnetic field for a while at least in its first billion years, the planet had water and atmosphere just like its counterpart Earth does now. But then the planet's atmosphere was stripped away by the sun when it lost its magnetic field and the shield it offered. When its atmosphere was gone, the water too moved on, and now we have this barren wasteland with weak electromagnetic currents powered by the residual ferromagnetism from the rocks of the Martian crust as a reminder of its glory days. So what happened? On Earth, magnetic fields are created by the planet's core, which creates a magneto effect. The core itself has an outer liquid core and a solid inner core. Convective currents in the outer liquid core are produced as heat flows from the inner core to the outer core. The pattern of flow adopted by these convective currents is controlled by the Coriolis effect, Earth's rotation, and its inner core. So really, 
Earth's magnetosphere is the convection current of molten metals in its core. According to Professor Kai Hyros from the University of Tokyo's Department of Earth and Planetary Science, magnetic fields on other planets are thought to work the same way. Apparently, not Mars, whose internal composition may be molten iron enriched with sulfur. We also know that Mars's core is larger and less dense, thanks to seismic readings provided by Insights SEIS. Professor Hyros believes these things imply the presence of additional lighter elements, such as hydrogen. And if the information supplied by Insight is accurate, the presence of hydrogen in the FESH core might have engineered the loss of Mars's magnetic field. To check this, Professor Hyro stated, with this detail, we prepare iron alloys that we expect to constitute the core and subject them to experiments. What the professor was talking about was to subject the FESH system to high pressures. This was something that had never been done before but the result would give a better understanding of what happened to Mars's core. So, with a sample that contained iron, sulfur, and hydrogen, F-E-S-H, to imitate the conditions of the Mars's core, the researchers placed the sample in a diamond anvil cell, DAC. The DAC compresses samples between two small diamond plates. They use diamonds because they can withstand extreme pressures naturally, and this DAC machine was able to subject microscopic samples to pressures of hundreds of gigapascals. There was a laser that heated the sample provided the extreme heat as it would be in the Mars's core. With a sample under extreme pressure and temperature, an X-ray and electron beams were used to monitor changes. The result? The FESH sample melted there was a change in its composition separating into two different liquids and completely immiscible. Professor Hyros explained, the initially homogeneous FESH separated out into two distinct liquids with a level of complexity that has not been seen before under these kinds of pressures. One of the iron liquids was rich in sulfur, the other rich in hydrogen. And this is key to explaining the birth and eventual death of the magnetic field around Mars. Since FESHs couldn't mix and remain homogeneous at high temperatures and pressures, it lost the ability to undergo convection, which is key for creating a magnetic field. Instead, its liquid separated, leading to gravitational stability and compositional stratification. Of course, further studies would be conducted to have a complete understanding of what went wrong. But thanks to the now-retired insight, we are taking a step on the right track. Perseverance delivered another set of new information about Mars. The rover had not arrived on the planet alone, but was accompanied by its helicopter companion, Ingenuity. The primary mission was to search for signs of past life on Mars, and the Jezero crater was selected as the destination for the mission because it looked like a lake environment. Hence, it possibly had a past life, and its delta would keep evidence of such life. The rover had spent its arrival on the planet collecting rock samples, revealing shocking and unexpected findings like cross-sections that showed broken interlocking crystals. It picked up rocks that had a textbook igneous volcanic rock texture. Over the following six months, it had more rocks of igneous texture. There were other rocks that showed olivine crystals. There were these purple rocks which created a sense of wonder among scientists. Purple coatings and splotches were observed in images of the rocks. The purple is a consistent feature of the rocks in Perseverance's landing area. The initial assumption was cyanobacteria, since they happen to cause such color to appear on rocks here on Earth. But the problem with this assumption is the presence of perchlorates on Mars, which are highly toxic and may stop the growth of the cyanobacteria. Using the rover's pixel instrument, which uses an X-ray beam to identify each rock composition, the rover provided an X-ray spectrometry of an abraded rock from the floor of the Jezero crater, providing some clues to the rock's chemistry and dating. According to an official, nailing down the geologic timescale is of critical importance for us understanding Mars as a habitable world, and we can't do that without samples to date. Aside from exploring the grounds of the crater, Perseverance also moved to the delta, which is a standing and lasting body of water, to search for sedimentary rocks. Why this type of rock? Because it creates this environment that is very, very good for preserving the organic matter. And since the goal of the mission is to search out the organic matter by understanding the features to look out for, recording the biosignatures becomes easier. The rover would put the samples into a small rocket to be launched from Mars to Earth in the 2030s. 
NASA and the European Space Agency would work together to collect the samples. Apart from sample collection, Perseverance used its laser and both mast and chassis microphone to measure how temperature affects the speed of sound on Mars. Los Alamos National Laboratory scientists recorded sounds from the Jezero crater. including the sound of the laser hitting rocks and Ingenuity's helicopter blades. Sylvester Maurice, an astrophysicist at the University of Toulouse in France and lead author of the study, said, It's a new sense of investigation we've never used before on Mars. I expect many discoveries to come, using the atmosphere as a source of sound and the medium of propagation. The study's findings demonstrate that sound travels slower and varies with frequency on Mars compared to Earth. The speed of sound on Mars is 537 miles per hour, 240 meters per second, for low-pitch sounds, and 559 miles per hour, 250 meters per second, for high-pitch sounds, whereas it is 767 miles per hour, 343 meters per second, on Earth. The speed of sound on Mars is influenced by its thin, chilly carbon dioxide atmosphere. Although the impact had been expected, it had never previously been seen firsthand. Furthermore, noises are not very audible on Mars. Even low-pitched sounds are not audible beyond 213 feet, while high-pitched sounds are not audible beyond 26 feet. What if we had to live underground? The scientists figured out that low-lying regions like the northern lowlands and Valles Marineras, as well as depths of 3.28 to 5.25 feet below the surface, would be the ideal places for future Martian colonies. Higher surface pressures on Mars can lessen the quantity of heavy ion GCR radiation, but not to the extent necessary to completely shield astronauts from harm, according to recent research. Nevertheless, the interaction of GCRs against shielding materials might result in secondary particles, a phenomenon known as cosmic ray showers, which are caused by shielding materials. The habitat may see an increase in neutron radiation as a result of these particles. Consequently, the radiation dose that astronauts might get might be considerably increased by the shielding material. It was found by the scientists that the best values of the neutron flux and effective dosage occur approximately one foot below the surface of Mars. This discovery raises the possibility of a safe and efficient use of loose soil, or regolith, from Mars as shielding material. With thicker atmospheric pressure than other regions of Mars, the northern lowlands and Valles Marineres would provide the best protection from cosmic radiation while also having access to important resources such as water and ice.